Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and this video starts the animated battle map series on Shiloh. Before I jump into the video, I wanted to mention that I have been adding a lot of new designs to the Teespring store that I think you will enjoy, and some will even make you laugh. A note before I jump into the battle, the locations of the units are not always exact, plus I'm using a 19th century map to depict the battle, therefore the dimensions are just a little off but I'll do my best to illustrate as correct as possible the placement of each unit. Although railroads had emerged as one of the most powerful economic drivers in the United States history in the mid 19th century, the country's river systems remained one of its greatest assets and none more important than the Mississippi River. Because of it, farmers from the Midwest and planters from the South could get their goods to domestic and international markets quickly. The Civil War tore the country apart, and it is no surprise that the Mississippi River became a focal point for both sides as they struggled against one another. Confederate General Braxton Bragg commented that the river was of more importance to us than all the country together, and Union General William Tecumseh Sherman stated, to secure the safety of the navigation of the Mississippi River, I would slay millions. On that point, I am not only insane, but mad. Fortunately. The Great West is with me there. The staging ground was set for the Confederacy and the Union to fight for the vital river that was termed the Father of Rivers. But one of the most significant battles to occur for its control didn't even take place near its banks. It occurred along one of its tributaries, the Tennessee River, near a little church named Shiloh, or Place of Peace. Throughout 1861, the two sides met in relatively small engagements, with the Confederate defensive line in the West remaining virtually unmoved. However, on January 19, 1862, Confederate Generals George B. Crittenden and Felix Zollicoffer were defeated by Union General George H. Thomas at Mill Springs, Kentucky. Zollicoffer lost his life in the defeat. With one of the biggest threats in the eastern portion of Kentucky defeated and contained, Union forces were able to concentrate their troops against Confederate general and commander of the Western Theater, Albert Sidney Johnston in central Kentucky. Johnston hoped to protect Tennessee's waterways, the Mississippi River, and Tennessee's capital, Nashville, by setting up his defensive line in southern Kentucky. However, the Cumberland and Tennessee Rivers created a perfect invasion route for Union troops led by Ulysses S. Grant, and about a month after Mill Springs, Grant would capture the two major fortifications protecting those tributaries of the Mississippi River, Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. The Confederates were forced to fall back to a more defensible location in northern Mississippi, but Johnston needed to land a decisive blow against the Union if he was to stop the takeover of more Confederate territory. Union forces gathered at Fort Henry to be sent by riverboats up the Tennessee River with some troops traveling by land. The crowded boats over this long trip made the soldiers miserable. One soldier commented, You may probably think that riding a steamboat is fun. Well, it is a nice place to ride in warm weather, but on a boat where there is nearly 2,000 men on board and then stay on it over a week is one of the most unpleasant places to live yet. And added to this, yet we had nothing but river water to drink, which is not fit for a hog to drink. The first boats arrived at Savannah, Tennessee on March 8th, where they found loyal Unionists there to greet them. Confederate sympathizers had left upon hearing of the Federal advance. One old gray-headed man who, when he saw the boats come up, he went down with the tears rolling down his cheeks and greeted them as hard as he could. Many of the young men of the area began joining Illinois and Ohio units. Some Confederates were spotted at a location called Pittsburgh Landing and General Hurlbut's division was sent to secure that location and drive back the rebels. General Sherman, after testing other landings, found that it was the only location that could handle the boat traffic, and he alerted his commander, General Charles F. Smith, who had recently taken over from Grant at General Henry Halleck's direction. Smith confirmed the location as the encampment of the army. While going from a boat to a small rowboat, Smith injured one of his legs and skinned up his shin, which became very sore and swollen but he would continue to direct troop movements until Halleck reversed his decision and placed Grant back in command of federal forces on the expedition. Albert Sidney Johnston scrambled out of Kentucky and Middle Tennessee with the state government in tow. He settled on concentrating his forces at Corinth, Mississippi, the site of a major crossroads of railroads 
and the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, sent him troops from other departments and other areas of the South. Regiments and brigades were coming in by rail and by foot from the banks of the Mississippi River and as far away as the Gulf Coast to aid Johnston. General Polk's units would be involved in a multiple rail car pileup on the way to northern Mississippi, but the army was slowly coming together. A soldier amazed at the sight of the growing army explained with glee that we are part of a grand army whose tents are pitched on the ridges all about us as far as we can see through the woods. At Reveille we hear bands of music in every direction, some so far off as to be almost inaudible. By this we know that our force is considerable. Although the army looked grand in its size, Confederate General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard was charged with the immense task of organizing them into army units, and he opted for the corps system. This type of organization with a new army created a need for more brigadier generals, and thus many colonels of regiments who were raw recruits themselves would command large brigades of likewise green troops. A series of arrests, particularly Generals Crittenden and Carroll for drunkenness and neglect of command, created another power vacuum where unproven officers were placed in command of large units, like John C. Breckinridge, who was not West Point trained. Many of the troops entering camp had just mustered in and had yet to fire their rifles, some batteries yet to fire their cannons. Although it was a hulking force, it was dangerously undertrained. Ultimately, it would have been better for Johnston to have waited while his men were properly trained, and he preferred that course of action. But the movement of Union troops out of Pittsburgh Landing forced his hand. Additionally, he found that Grant's forces were split at the moment, and to give himself the best possible advantage, he decided to attack while the Federals were weak, before General Don Carlos Buell could reinforce Grant. Although Johnston was the commander of the army, he allowed Beauregard to organize the march to Pittsburgh Landing and lay out the tactical situation once there. The army moved out on April 3rd in a confusing mass of humanity, units marching and countermarching, attempting to fit within the puzzle that was Beauregard's marching orders. Nevertheless, the army was now on the move, poised to strike the unsuspecting Union forces at the landing. As the army formed into battle lines, they sent out skirmishers to fill out the Union positions. Some Federal pickets caught Confederate prisoners and locked them in the Shiloh Church. It was April 5th, and despite the sounds of skirmishing and the astonishing amount of rabbits, deer, and other wildlife moving through their encampment, the Federals did not realize the entire Confederate army was less than a mile away from their position. It was on the evening of April 5th that Johnston happened upon a group of his corps commanders and Beauregard discussing withdrawing, fearing that they had lost the element of surprise. Johnston ended the discussion in stating, Gentlemen, we shall attack at daylight tomorrow. As he was walking away, he remarked to a staff officer, I would fight them if they were a million. They can present no greater front between these two creeks than we can, and the more men they crowd in there, the worse we can make it for them. His plan was to turn the Union Army away from the river and the safety of their gunboats by driving in the Union's left flank, and as he put it, I intend to hammer them. About 4 a.m., the Confederate Army roused up from their sleep and took up their positions in preparation for the major attack. Instead of lining up parallel to the Union in a west-to-east orientation, they instead lined up in a northwest-to-southeast orientation, and this would play a significant role in the movement of the Army in one simultaneous assault that Beauregard had planned. Nevertheless, not all of the Union forces were unsuspecting. Many brigade and regimental commanders sent out companies and larger units to reconnoiter the ground. One of those units was the 25th Missouri, who approached Fraley Field, discovering the 3rd Mississippi Battalion on the other end of the field, opposing them. Each side let loose volleys at one another. Johnston recorded the time of those first shots at 5.14 a.m. The Battle of Shiloh had begun. They battled for an hour before the Missourians and Michiganders fell back a short distance and linked up with the rest of the brigade, who was coming towards the sound of battle. It was around 6.30 when the main Confederate line of Hardy's Corps lurched forward against Peabody, but the movement was slow because of the dense undergrowth and undulating terrain that forced regiments to halt and realign their companies. Despite the overwhelming numbers, the rebels were moving amazingly slow against such an inferior force. The Union Brigade fell back when confronted with the entirety of Hardy's Corps, and now the perpendicular nature of the Confederate battle line became cumbersome. 
Beauregard emphasized keeping the lines together, but that was easier said than done with shells exploding, bullets whizzing by soldiers' heads, and the uneven terrain destroying the linear formations. Brigadier General Patrick Claiborne's regiment sat to Wood's left, but his brigade swung abruptly north, breaking contact with Wood's men. Now, Hardy had to swing his entire corps northward, all the while attempting not to disconnect his brigades. Therefore, Claiborne's troops became engaged first, all the while the rest of the men in the corps would lose valuable time and be unable to support him right away. Claiborne, an Irish immigrant who had served in the British military prior to immigrating to the United States, moved his men toward a valley containing the Shiloh Branch, where he could see Sherman's encampment. As his men made their way toward the enemy, the brigade split to avoid the swampy area and to secure the flank, with two regiments going to the right and the other four shuffling to the left to avoid as much of the swampy area as possible. Claiborne's horse became stuck and threw the Irishman, and he barely extricated himself and his mount. Sherman, now drawn to the sounds of battle, wanted to see for himself what engagement had erupted. Claiborne's skirmishers, seeing the mounted gentleman, fired, hitting Sherman in the hand and killing his escort, Thomas Holliday. After that brief brush with death, Sherman wasted no time in ordering forward his brigades. By this point in the battle, the Confederate plan to keep their frontline brigades in contact with one another had fallen apart. Claiborne's men had broken off from Wood's brigade because the terrain forced him on a more northerly route. His right two regiments launched three assaults against the Ohioans, but got repulsed badly, eventually forcing both regiments to fall back. Of the 425 men the 6th Mississippi took into battle, 300 had either been killed or wounded. The 70% casualty rate gave the nickname to that unit, the Bloody Sixth. Braxton Bragg's brigades were close behind Claiborne's men, and after the Irishman's troops failed to dislodge the Union defenders, Bragg sent Patton Anderson's brigade to the front, and together, both brigades slammed into Sherman's troops, but the repulse was another bloody one for the Confederates. Seeing that Hardy's Corps' left flank was in the air, Bragg sent the brigade of Colonel Preston Pond in a big swinging motion out to the west to secure the battle line. Brigadier General Daniel Ruggles, Anderson's division commander, begged Brigadier General Bushrod Johnson of Polk's Corps to send his brigade to help Anderson and what was left of Claiborne's brigade to push back the Yankees. Johnson's men attacked just to the right of the other two brigades. No headway could be made, however, and the Union batteries played havoc in the Confederate ranks. Johnson sent the right two regiments, Blythe's Mississippians and the 154th Tennessee, in an effort to outflank the stubborn Union regiments, but Johnson's left began to give way, and most likely would have broke if Lieutenant Colonel Robert Charles Tyler of the 15th Tennessee hadn't drew his pistol to force his and other regiments to reform. Tyler would have three horses shot out from under him and would soon become wounded himself, having to be taken from the field. The reformed units would attack again, but ultimately got pushed back taking heavy casualties, especially in the form of officers. Bushrod Johnson himself would be wounded, shot in the stomach. An odd reunion of sorts took place as the wounded Johnson rode to the rear. He found his way to a hospital where, as chance would have it, two of his former students from the University of Nashville were lying wounded awaiting the overworked surgeon. The students were members of the 6th Mississippi, and when they saw their former professor arrive, they helped him from his horse and laid him on the ground. After conversing with him for a few moments, he asked if they could get a Yankee paper from his back pocket that some of the members of his regiment had picked up from the battlefield. The surgeon then called the boys to be examined, and they left him laying on the ground, wounded, reading the newspaper. The Confederate lines were disorganized, and with each regiment that attacked through the valley losing a considerable amount of men, some brigades were just a hodgepodge of what men could be pulled together without regard for which regiment they were in. Desperate to find more men to launch at the well-defended troops of William T. Sherman, the brigade of Colonel Robert M. Russell was sent to the front to the northern end of Ray Field to support what was left of the rebel right flank. A few of Claiborne's men had stayed in that sector as the rest had pulled back. The terrain again disrupted an attack. Russell's men dove down into the valley of the shallow branch, when to avoid the swampy terrain, his right two regiments splintered off to the east, while the 11th Louisiana advanced on the Union battery that had been delivering destruction to the Confederates all morning, but were thrown back in confusion. Colonel Samuel F. Marks of the 11th, who had lost his right arm at the Battle of Belmont, now lost his left arm in the bloody assault. 
the 22nd Tennessee had finally extricated itself from the swamp and together they prepared for an assault. Sherman had held on brilliantly, utilizing the terrain to the best of his advantage and had held off attacks by four Confederate brigades over the course of two hours. One soldier would name the little valley created by the Shiloh Branch the Valley of Death. As Russell's men were coming up to support the Confederate right flank in this sector, Major General John A. McClernand sent messengers to Sherman asking what the situation was, and when McClernand started seeing the wounded moving through his camp north of Sherman, he sent Colonel Julius Wraith's brigade to extend the Union line to the east. Now Sherman was prepared to throw back any Confederate unit that came against him. However, to the east, the division of Brigadier General Benjamin Prentiss was not so fortunate. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. As history will travel, reads the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the hard land. To educate the world. A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian